Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to an episode of Spitting Venom, aka The Venom Vlog, and I'm sorry it's taken me a whole week pretty much to get another episode up. The main reason for that is because we had a lot of stories to wrap up. My goal was to always finish uh, you know, season two, episode 300. I wanted to finish all the Mac Gargan Venom stuff before we got to there. So that way when we start season three, we can go back to the Eddie Brock stories that we missed and then let those bleed into the Flash Thompson stuff and get us up to more of the modern stuff that's been coming out. And so, uh, you know, as my, you know, my planning kind of got out of whack when there was, you know, TV spots and movie news dropping left and right, and interviews dropping left and right, and uh, just anticipation for the movie. And then actually going to, to an event where Tom Hardy was, like it just threw everything off schedule in a good way. Uh, but what it did was lead us to this episode, which is we're going to wrap up the Matt Gargan stuff, you know, all the Matt Gargan Venom stuff. We're going to get it out of the way in this one episode. So this episode's probably going to be pretty long. I will most likely, you know, oversimplify a few things, skim over a few things. So you're not going to get the full story of the stuff we talk about today. I'm going to do my best to give you as much as I can, but I also don't want this to be a two or three hour video. I'm going to try to keep it around 45 minutes if possible, uh, or, you know, to an hour at the most. So hopefully I hit that marker, uh, you know, for you guys, uh, because there's a lot to cover here. So I would encourage you every story we talk about today is really good. I'm not even kidding. And that's why I wanted to do it and spread it out over, you know, five or six episodes. But unfortunately, just due to time and however, you know, the amount of episodes we have left before we get to 300, I figured let's just do it now, get it out of the way, and I can skim over this stuff and just direct you guys to buy it all yourself because it's really, really awesome. Uh, literally, I think there's not a single book that we're going to go over today that I don't like. There's maybe one or two that I might mention is the weakest of them, but that's just because they're all really, really awesome. So without further ado, let's find out how Matt Gargan, a.k.a. The Scorpion, uh, you know, who we've been going over in the comic episodes lately and, you know, in season two, uh, let's go over his conclusion. How does he stop being Venom and how does that costume go, you know, get into the hands of the government where it's passed on to Flash Thompson? That's what we're going to talk about. So let's start right now with Thunderbolts burning down the house. The story is written by Andy Diggle and the art is by Roberto De La Torre. And the reason I'm starting with this one and not Dark Avengers, because obviously where we left off, you know, uh, Norman Osborn and his, you know, Thunderbolts team, they saved the world from the secret invasion. They killed the Skrulls. The Skrull Queen was taken out by Norman Osborn. And now the president has come to him and said, all right, he's like our hero. He was captured on camera when Iron Man kind of flew to space to help Thor and all the other heroes were like dispersed and they were getting ready to plan their attack. And Wolverine was going to go in and get the kill, uh, you know, along with the other Avengers and, and take down the Skrull Queen. Norman Osborn didn't hesitate and blew her brain right out of her head and so now the world loves Norman Osborn and so obviously what's happening now is he's being groomed to become you know the, the leader of the new Avengers he's going to become Iron Patriot which is a mixture between the Iron Man armor and the uh, Captain America logo essentially and you saw that in the third Iron Man movie and so I remember when that came out a lot of people were like whoa is Iron Patriot, like, is Norman Osborn going to be in the movie? Uh, obviously, that didn't happen, but uh, that's why people were speculating that. And so uh, now here we, you know, have the moments before he becomes the leader of the Avengers. Because there's a lot of baggage with Norman Osborn. And what I like that Andy Diggle does here is he wraps all that up. He's like, look, here's the thing. No one's really, there's going to be a lot of people that don't trust Norman Osborn. Obviously, we have Doc Sampson, who we talked about in the previous run of Thunderbolts uh, by Warren Ellis. Uh, he is like the team psychiatrist, and he's there for Robbie. And he strongly uh, disagrees with Norman Osborn getting any kind of power. And so, obviously, we have him talking to the president going, look, you don't know the guy like I do. He's the Green Goblin. He's all this. So, there's that thread that needs to be wrapped up. There's the case of what happens to the Thunderbolts, uh, because obviously some members are not going to sign up for Norman Osborn. They're not going to want to go another round with him after the horrible things that have happened during his you know, leadership of the Thunderbolts, even though he put them all in the spotlight. Because the ones he put in the spotlight were like Venom and Moonstone and a lot of those other characters, Swordsman. But still, some of them don't like him. They don't like Norman Osborn. They, they know he's a real psychopath and they don't want to work with him anymore. So this is Norman Osborn wrapping all that up putting together a new team of Thunderbolts to take, you know, the place of his former team uh, because obviously the government still kind of has a Thunderbolt sanctioned group in Thunderbolts Mountain and they're paying for that. So he's like, all right, I'm going to give you a new team. I'm going to prove that I'm not the Green Goblin or at least put doubt in your mind that I'm not the Green Goblin. And I'm going to show you that uh, Doc Sampson is not the one you should trust. Uh, and so that's what Norman Osborn does in his book. So he goes and he talks to Congress and he deals with them. And then he's like, all right, I got to, you know, a date with the president now. I got to go talk to him. And, uh, and meanwhile, he's putting all these machinations uh, going in the background and he's having agents coming in and, you know, awakening Venom. And it's like, look, we have a plan. 
Uh, there's some members of this team that are not part of our next phase of the Dark Avengers, so we need to take them out. And so uh, that's what happens. So Venom goes around, starts eating up, you know, some people. Um, Bullseye goes and threatens uh, Songbird, but Songbird was actually able to get uh, Radioactive Man out of the country because he's like, hey, look, you know, I'm, I need to be extradited. There's all these things going on. I need to be taken away. And so she facilitates that and gets him out of there safely because obviously Bullseye and Venom were going to kill him or find a way to eat him or whatever. And uh, and so she was like, look, I don't I don't want to fight. I don't want anything like that here. I'm going to just put him on a helicopter. We're going to send him back to China and uh, and we're going to, you know, move on. So Radioactive Man gets out safely. But then, uh, you know, we have Songbird here and Swordsman who are left behind. And so Bullseye and Venom come after them, and that's kind of what their roles are. We get a lot of Venom action in this where he's, like, tracking her. He's trying to find her. Uh, you know, she sneaks away. She gets away from Bullseye. Then she gets into a ship, and she, you know, powers it up. And she goes to, like, blow the living crap out of uh, their headquarters and try to kill Bullseye at the same time. Obviously, it doesn't go her way, and Venom jumps on the ship and crash lands it. Uh, but then Swordsman shows up to save her. So they do get away, but now they're fugitives. They're wanted fugitives. Fugitives. And meanwhile, Norman Osborn's like, I still need a new team in place. So even though we didn't exactly kill all of them, they're loose ends. Don't worry, we'll find them. But I need a Thunderbolt team to be in place. So that way, you know, if they ever get called on, I have a team to send in. And if I need to pick up these loose threads later and have Songbird and Swordsman killed and Radioactive Man killed, I need a good team to do that. So he recruits some really interesting characters. I think he gets Paladin on there. Um, he gets uh, the second Black Widow, uh, Yelena Belova. Um, he puts her in charge of the team, Ghost. Uh, a lot of you have seen that character in the latest Ant-Man and Wasp movie. This is not the female version of Ghost. I believe it's the male version of Ghost, but still, you know, Ghost is on the team. Uh, and then he has uh, also Headsman. And Headsman is like this old villain that he has dress up as the Green Goblin. So when Norman Osborn is on uh, Air Force One with Doc Sampson and the President, he has the Green Goblin, you know, Headsman dressed as Green Goblin, attack the plane. Uh, and then give Norman Osborn a chance to, uh, you know, prove himself as a good person. So he tries to save the President's life against the Green Goblin. Um, and then at the same time, they hired Ant-Man, this like a kind of a more of a thief version of Ant-Man, like a different character. And he's, uh, he's you know, kind of a bad guy. I think his book was called The Irredeemable Ant-Man. And I apologize, I don't know a ton about this character just from what I read in here. Uh, but he shows up and implants a device inside Doc Samson to make him rage out, to kind of make him hulk out. So then they have to deal with that. And it shows that Doc Samson is not fully stable in front of the president. So now the president is more inclined to believe Norman Osborn, or at least give him the benefit of the doubt that he is not fully bad and that they live in a world of grays and that maybe Norman Osborn is on the lighter side of the gray than on the darker side. And that's kind of what Norman Osborn wanted. And that's what he proves in his book. So it's really neat. You see Norman Osborn kind of become you know like again proving himself because why else like why would anyone just hand him the avengers he has to go through all the processes and that's what this book does and it shows his journey of getting into you know the white house talking to the president going on air force one setting up his new team where he has headsman ant-man ghost uh, black widow 2 and paladin all as the new thunderbolts uh, which is really cool i thought that was a great team to put together and andy diggle does a great job writing this book from here on out but unfortunately we're not going to follow the book from here on out because they have another mission. They're going to go off. They're going to hunt down Deadpool and everything. So I highly recommend you go pick up Andy Diggle's run on Thunderbolts because it is very good. And it's a really good book and the artwork is fantastic. So I recommend it, you know, very much. Uh, but for now, we're going to cut over to the Norman Osborn stuff and we're going to follow him and Venom, who becomes the new Spider-Man, and they are going to start the Dark Avengers. Dark Avengers was a monthly comic book, and it was written by Brian Michael Bendis, you guys know I've been very critical of, but in this you know, regard, I feel like this is some of his best work. He did a really good job writing all these characters, uh, turning these villains into heroes, and coming up with reasons why the, the public would kind of believe it, you know, believe that they're the same heroes they've always known. And that's kind of the neat thing about this book, is that he he looked at it and said, you know, these heroes have had secret identities for years. Uh, so no one really knows who they are, except Iron Man as Tony Stark. But if we put Norman Osborn in and he publicly says, hey, I'm Iron Patriot, uh, and then he just has Wolverine by his side and, you know, Spider-Man and Miss Marvel, no one's going to question that those aren't the same Miss Marvel and same, you know, Spider-Man. Uh, or they'll just think, oh, maybe it's a new person in the suit, but, you know, they maybe they were vetted by the previous ones. So to the public, they just think these are the same heroes. And that's what I really liked about this. And that what Bendis did was it was a PR game. We talked about that with Warren Ellis's run with uh, Norman Osborn. He was trying to stay in the spotlight and, you know, win the PR game, win the public favor. 
And that's what he did. And now it's rewarded. You know, he's paid in full by becoming the leader of the new Avengers team, which of course they don't call themselves the Dark Avengers, uh, but that was just what the book was called. And it was under a banner called Dark Reign, which was when the villains essentially took over the Marvel Universe because you had the heroes that kind of put together this a little Illuminati team with like Doctor Strange and Black Panther and Professor Xavier and Reed Richards. And it was all these guys trying to do what was best for the world and, you know, coming up with secret plans and stuff to try to, you know, like lead the world in a better direction. And now now what happened is they've all been taken out and all the heroes are on the run and wanted and you have Norman Osborn part of a group called the Cabal and it is a, a circle of members that are all evil people or at least morally gray people because you have Emma Frost on there from uh, the X-Men you know uh, the White Queen and she's already kind of proven herself to be more of a good guy again but then she decided to go and meet with you know Norman Osborn and these others to see if she can help speak for mutant kind and come up with things that will help benefit them but of course Norman Osborn and the others don't care about that and we'll We'll get into that as that story progresses. Uh, but for this one, we're just going to talk about the first six issues of Dark Avengers. Uh, other members of the Cabal, there was like Doctor Doom, Loki, and uh, I think Namar, the Submariner, is on there. And so, uh, so they're kind of in the background, and they're you know kind of came up with this whole you know blueprint of what they're going to do for the world. And instantly that blueprint gets affected when Morgan Le Fay, this you know, mystical character, decides to try to take down Doctor Doom. And Doctor Doom is not easily killed for sure, but she has a plan and she's sending different versions of herself. She's like in the past, but she's sending like a version of herself from like minutes in the future, you know, to keep going. And anytime she dies, she just sends another one and another one. And it's kind of a headache to think about really the logic behind it. But either way, that's kind of what's happening. And she's sending, you know, people or versions of herself to try to kill Dr. Doom. And uh, of course, Norman Osborn can't have that. He needs Doom around. There's, you know, political stuff going on with Latveria and America now, and they're coming up with all these plans for the world. So Norman Osborn's like, look, I need to put together a team you know, to go, you know, not only just help the world or look like we're heroes, but then also in this case of Doom. So he doesn't know that Doom stuff's happening right away. And what he's focused on is, you know, doing a press tour and getting, you know, the world to know who his Avengers are going to be. So what he does is he goes to Matt Gargan. Venom obviously starts with him and he gives him like a serum that brings him down. As you'll see in the image here, he looks like Spider-Man. And it's like a cool nod to Spider-Man from Secret Wars number two, uh, or number uh, eight, when he first gets the, the black costume. Uh, and he's kind of sitting there like, whoa, what's this? Um, it was kind of neat to see that image like redrawn as Matt Gargan kind of becomes Spider-Man for the first time. So to the public, he just looks like black costume Spider-Man, which at this point in the comics, Spider-Man was running around in the black costume. So it's kind of neat. And then, of course, he hires Ghost from the Thunderbolts. And he says, hey, can you come in and help me break into this chamber? Uh, Iron Man had it locked up, and I need you to help me break in. So Ghost does. And inside this chamber was a bunch of Iron Man suits that now Norman Osborn has control of. So he's like, all right, we're going to put these suits together. And then they go out and they recruit other people. Uh, Novar is uh, this guy, uh, this Kree guy who... Uh, they decide to make their new Captain Marvel. Uh, then they get the Sentry. You know, obviously Bob, he's like a broken dude. We talked about him in the uh, Spider-Man Prison Break storyline, I think, uh, a while back where Carnage got out. Um, but anyway, Bob, he's kind of um, like this Superman being, and he has a split personality, and it's called the Void. And the Void is like this uh, Cthulhu-like dimensional creature, interdimensional creature that kind of has a hold over Bob. And uh, so there's a lot of creepy stuff going on with him. But Norman Osborn, being crazy himself, is able to talk to Bob and get him to restrain himself. Uh, then they also get Moonstone to dress up to be the new Miss Marvel because when they go try to recruit Carol Danvers, she will not play ball and she decides to give up and go on the run and be a fugitive. So Norman Osborn's like, no problem. I have Moonstone from the Thunderbolts. She's going to be the new Miss Marvel. Uh, and then we have Wolverine, who they actually get Wolverine's son, uh, Dokken, or Dekken, I believe his name is. And Deken comes in and he's looks like Wolverine's just younger. He's got two claws, he's got tattoos on him, but they're just like, whatever, put him in the brown and yellow costume or the brown and tan costume and let's put him out there and he's our Wolverine. Uh, then they have Ares the God of War because they needed a Thor. So it's funny because Norman Osborn's going through all the checklists like, we need a Thor, we needed this, we needed that. And they find Ares the God of War and he's a great addition to the team. He's a just a big brute guy, but, uh, but he has a lot of heart to him that we're going to learn throughout this series. Uh, then he gets Bullseye from Daredevil, uh, who was also a Thunderbolts member, and he turns Bullseye into the new Hawkeye, because he's like, hey, you can hit any target, why don't you dress up as Hawkeye? And uh, Bullseye kind of gets a kick out of it, he's like, yeah, that's kind of funny, yeah, I'll be Hawkeye. Um, and then you have Spider-Man, obviously, which is Matt Gargan, who just looks like black costume Spider-Man, but he's still Venom. In the first trade paperback, after Norman Osborn has introduced the world to his team, 
he hears about the Doctor Doom incident, and he's like, okay, we got to send our people in. So now that we have our team together, Avengers, let's assemble and let's go save Doctor Doom. And they're like, is this good for our PR? Like, or should we go save Doctor Doom? He's like, hey, look, we could turn it into like a, you know, like a helping other countries thing. It can make us look good for uh, Latveria relations, whatever. Uh, but either way, we got to go in and we got to stop this from happening because he's a member of my cabal and I need him alive for right now. So, uh, so they go in and they start attacking Morgan Le Fay. And Morgan like turns Venom. She like lets him loose. So he becomes Venom again. It's almost like some of it's kind of instant. It's like, oh, he was just Spider-Man. And now he's turning into a big Venom monster and eating everybody again and attacking his own teammates and stuff. But that's what Morgan is doing. She's kind of trying to turn everybody on each other, making them hallucinate, see different things. Uh, but ultimately, the Avengers unite. They take her down. Uh, Bob, you know, the sentry, uh, gets a good shot at her, rips her head off, and then another version of her from the past comes in. So then what ends up happening is Norman Osborn teams up with Doctor Doom, and they go back to the distant, distant past uh, before she starts casting all these spells. They get her. They throw her even further into the past uh, and then lock her in, you know, with, powerless in a world where, where the dinosaurs have you know, still roaming on the earth. Uh, and so, uh, so that was kind of their way of, you know, getting rid of her, at least for a while. And, uh, and so then Doom got, he has his castle back, he has Latveria back, and then his relationship with the U.S., I guess, through Norman Osborn, has kind of patched up. And so it looks like a win-win situation for everyone. And then at the same time, the Avengers look like they've saved the day, uh, but they did uh, apparently lose Bob in the battle. Sentry looks like he died at one point, but then at the end of the book, when they go back to Avengers Tower, he shows up again, fully restored and back into his original condition. And that's when Norman Osborn really takes a second look at Bob, and he's like, all right, I really have to understand this guy. His powers are out of control. I saw him blow up essentially and now he's back in full form um and he's like so i need to know what makes this guy tick so he starts talking to bob a lot more bob reveals that he has a, he had a wife he thought she was dead she's now alive uh and so norman osborne has her and basically is keeping her in avengers tower so that you know in bob's room so bob can always you know go home uh to you know to see her and it kind of calms him down so this is a norman osborne's way of manipulating bob but it's not really working because bob is cracked you know his his mind is broken and so so he has moments where you know he's calm around his wife and then there's moments where she's afraid of him because of the void creature that is inside his head uh, and so Norman Osborn again just trying to keep an eye on that situation and then Ares of God of War we learned that he has a son who has been recruited by Nick Fury to be a part of his secret warriors so you know Ares is kind of has a, a beef with Nick Fury over that so he gets a, a, a couple issues where he gets to go and talk to Nick Fury and then talk to his son and his son's like look you're out there saving the world you're an Avenger and everything but I have powers I want to do my part too I want to be just like my dad and so Ares is like, all right, fine. Like you, you can continue to work with Nick Fury, but Nick Fury, if anything happens to my son, uh, you know, you're basically dead. And so Nick Fury's like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm prepared basically. So that's kind of where they end up in the second trade paperback, which is them versus the Molecule Man. And so they, after that kind of encounter, they go and they battle the Molecule Man. And the Molecule Man is, you know, kind of rewriting things. He's a, you know, he sees Norman Osborn and Norman Osborn's like, hey, I'm the king of the world. And Molecule Man's like, really? Because I can rewrite history. I can rewrite anything. Thing. I can mess with your molecules. I can mess with your mind. Uh, he's like, I'm making you see things. Like I'm standing on the, the, the tower of hell. Uh, and he's like, and I have Mephisto beneath me. And I have all these other like powerful creatures, Dormammu, and everyone beneath me, and they're all serving me. And he's like, so you really think you're that powerful, Norman Osborn? And Norman and him get into a spat. They get into a battle. Uh, obviously, the Sentry gets involved in Ares and everything. And finally, Molecule Man backs down. And he's just like, you know what? this isn't worth it you know he's like he's like I'll, I'll i'll take a step back and i'll go do my thing and uh norman you go do your thing but if our paths cross again i am definitely going to end you and so norman osborne's like fine whatever i have the x-men to deal with now because over in san francisco the x-men have kind of you know migrated over there away from new york and they've created a little island called utopia x i believe and that's the name of this book is called utopia x and this is the next chapter in the uh, dark avengers storyline where the uh, the x-men are being persecuted you know the mutants are not having a good go after you know a lot of events that happened in the comics around this time they're even more persecuted than they were before and so they're trying to stand up for their their rights they're doing you know protests and people are protesting against them and it's that whole thing like we see a lot in x-men comics uh but this time you know cyclops is he doesn't know what to do he's kind of like all right we're on our island i don't know how else to restrict us even more and keep us away from people um but we everything's keeps getting you know we keep getting involved and and people keep hating us no matter what we do no matter how many times we try to save people it's not working like Xavier's dream isn't working we're losing this battle and and that's why Emma ultimately went to join the cabal secretly 
as to kind of get an insight on humans and and uh, Nor you know Norman Osborn and Loki and Doctor Doom and try to speak for mutants in this secret society that they're putting together. Uh, but what ends up happening is uh, Norman Osborn's like, look, I'm going to put together my own group of mutants uh, with Mimic and Namor, and he's like, and I'm going to have you, Emma Frost, be the leader of them, and you're my mutants. I'm going to put you on the news, kind of like I have with Thunderbolts. I have my own team of Thunderbolts, my own team of Avengers, and now I need my own X-Men. And you guys are going to speak, you know, uh, coherently for mutants, and anything Scott Summers and anyone else has to say, we're going to ignore them. We're going to call them radicals, and we're going to go after them. And Emma's on board a little bit at first, but then she sees the, you know, the fallout of that, and it's dividing the X-Men, and it's splitting the team apart. And, uh, and it's getting them involved in things that, uh, you know, that is just making them look worse and worse and worse, and Norman Osborn and everyone else better and better. And so ultimately, Emma decides to betray Norman Osborn and side with Scott Summers and, you know, help the X-Men fight back. And, uh, you know, at this point, Norman Osborn has captured Charles Xavier, and he's captured uh, Beast, Hank McCoy, and a couple other mutants. So the X-Men have to go in and bust them out. But they get everyone out, I believe, except Charles Xavier. I believe he's still kept behind. They're unable to get to him. Uh, because Dark Beast uh, from the Age of Apocalypse world is kind of, you know, um, guarding everything and, and set up all the traps and stuff. So they weren't able to get around him. Uh, and so now that, uh, you know, the X-Men had to retreat. And they got the, as many members as they could, but they couldn't get their mentor and, uh, you know, and their leader, Charles Xavier. So they go back and they're like, all right, well, we got to come up with another plan. And Emma's like, don't worry, I feel like this is all going to blow up in Norman Osborn's face. Maybe the best plan is to wait right now and not put any more people, you know, risks, uh, lives at risk. Uh, let's not lose any more team members and let's wait, uh, wait this out for a little bit just to see if Norman Osborn's empire does crumble and maybe we could take advantage of it at that point. So Cyclops is like, fine, we'll stay on the island. And that's when Norman Osborn's like, all right, the mutants, after all this, you know, big battle with them and everything, uh, they're going to stay on their island. They're you know, exiled from us. They're officially not part of America anymore. So if they come on American soil, they're officially enemies of the, you know, the country and we are going to take them down. But for now, we're going to let them stay on their island and leave, you know, leave them be. He's like, you know, because Norman Osborn, he's juggling a lot right now. And he's like, all right, I can't deal with them right now. But if they're going to stay on their island, then that's fine. I'll leave them over there. And in the meantime, he's put together his X-Men team and he even has Mystique, uh, you know, shapeshift into Charles Xavier. And he's like, all right, look, here's my X-Men team. And there's like Mimics on there and Namar and now Charles Xavier. And he's like, I got one of the greatest minds in the world on my team. And so here you go, you know, people and society, these are the X-Men. These are my X-Men, uh, you know, the dark X-Men, I guess. But he's like, these are my X-Men, and, uh, and they're the ones you should listen to, and, they're, and we should be peaceful between mutants and humans. And again, Norman Osborn playing that PR game, being like, look, look, see, here are my mutant friends kind of thing. And, uh, and it, it's working out. So, so now you have that. And then, uh, like I said, Mystique, she's secretly pretending to be Charles Xavier. And she's kind of getting a kick out of that too. So Norman Osborn's plan of you know getting villains to dress as heroes and you know and to you know to kind of twist the uh, the perception of of the world and get you know basic people to you know buy into this. He's like, hey, look, I got an X-Men team, I got a Thunderbolts team, I got an Avengers team, and we're all good. We're all hunky dory. Life is good. The country's safe. Isn't everything grand? So we've talked about the Thunderbolts, we've talked about the Dark Avengers Volume 1 and the Dark Avengers Volume 2, and we just got through the X-Men and Dark Avengers crossover called Utopia X. Uh, and again, I'm going to put links to Comixology down below to all these storylines, or maybe even the Amazon ones if they're still in print. Uh, but I'll probably stick with Comixology because at least I know it's a guarantee that you can get them this way because that's how I own all of these. And if you want to read these stories for yourself, I highly recommend them because there's a lot of stuff I'm not going over, and I'm just talking about the, you know, the essentials, the basics of these storylines. But there's so much cool stuff in all of these books and uh, and now that you know Norman Osborn has put together his Thunderbolts he's put together his X-Men he's he has his Avengers team they're you know they're in the spotlight they're winning over you know the crowd and everything now what does he got to do well he's got to go mess with Spider-Man so that's what he does in a crossover called American Sun and this event only takes place in the Amazing Spider-Man comic book so if you're looking for this trade paperback it's not going to be under Dark Avengers it'll be under Amazing Spider-Man American Sun and again, I'll put the link down below. But in this one, it's really great because a lot of the stuff we talked about during the New Ways to Die storyline where, where, you know, the story created Anti-Venom by Dan Slott. Uh, this one is uh, written by Joe Kelly, I believe, with art by Phil Jimenez. And hey, they come in and they tell their Spider-Man story where Norman Osborn is, uh, you know, coming into New York. And he's like, all right, we're going to, you know, I want to do something personal. So he's kind of grooming his son, Harry, to become a hero. He's like, you know what? I've done this. I've created, you know, this big legacy. I, I'm now the leader of the Avengers, and I don't want to leave my son behind. You know, I've, I mentioned before he's kind of a disappointment, and I, we've had our disagreements, but maybe he just needs 
some initiative. Maybe he just needs something to get him to, you know, step up. And so Norman Osborn is coming to New York to basically say, hey, I'm going to make you a new superhero. He, he makes a suit that kind of looks like an Iron Man suit with just a different helmet. And he's like, you're going to become the American son. And I'm going to recruit you to be a member of our Avengers and to be in the spotlight with me. And it's kind of something in a weird way Harry's always wanted. But the way Norman goes about it, it does make Harry a little hesitant. And obviously it does attract Peter's attention. And Peter's getting scared now too because Peter's still as Spider-Man on the run. Uh, things aren't going super well for him uh, and uh, and you know it, luckily no one knows he's Peter Parker anymore so he can still walk around freely as Peter but as Spider-Man he's still a wanted fugitive so uh, so him trying to get involved and trying to save Harry is really tough and in this moment you know again we didn't talk about Karn uh, or Venom a lot in the you know the X-Men crossover because really all he does in that book is fight Colossus you know over and over and over again which is cool the artwork's great uh, but they don't do a lot of story stuff with him in that one. And in the Molecule Man uh, graphic novel, they don't do a lot with Venom there either. But they do some cool stuff here with Venom. Because obviously Venom and Spider-Man have a past. And uh, and Matt Gargan and Spider-Man have a past. So uh, Norman Osborn does lean a little bit on Venom. A little bit more in this storyline when it comes to dealing with Spider-Man. And in this storyline, again, you have Harry Osborn being groomed to possibly, you know, step up and be a part of Norman's empire. Uh, but then things start to fall apart. And Norman... Uh, you know, actually reveals a horrible, horrible secret that Peter Parker finds out and then Harry finds out as well. And that is that Lily, uh, who we talked about in the New Ways to Die storyline, uh, Lily is uh, Harry Osborne's girlfriend and she is menace also. Her identity has been revealed that she is menace, the, the gray goblin that attacked Norman Osborn in, the, uh, in that storyline. And apparently that's maybe around the time they met because I don't think this was a long-term plan of Norman Osborn, but at the same time, I haven't read all these books, so I don't know. So maybe one of you guys can let me know down below if I get this wrong. But I think, you know, Norman Osborn and Menace met there on the rooftop in New Ways to Die. And then afterwards, he started to implement this plan once he found out who she was. And he just didn't tell anyone else who she was. He kept it to himself. Because what ends up happening is Lily, she's been pregnant for a while uh, with Harry's son or Harry's kid. But then what they find out in this story, and this is so horrible, and just speaks to Norman Osborn and what a disgusting monster he is. Uh, apparently, apparently that kid is Norman Osborn's. Uh, Lily is pregnant, not with her boyfriend's kid, but her boyfriend's dad's kid. It's really gross. Uh, I, I, it's really just disgusting. Um, and so Lily, you know, being menace and everything, she is now pregnant with Norman Osborn's kid. And so Norman Osborn tells, you know, uh, Peter, look, if Harry doesn't sign up with this American son thing, that's fine. I'll just keep the suit around and I'll keep my reign over the country and everything. And I'll be a hero for the next 20 years. And, uh, and my other son will find the suit and he'll, he'll live up to be like his father and he won't be a disappointment the way Harry was. And it's like, oh, it's so gross. Like Norman Osborn is just a monster. And at this point, you can understand why Spider-Man is almost willing to kill him because Wolverine comes to him and says, look, Spider-Man, I know this is your guy. This is like your saber tooth. This guy has done so many horrible things to you in your life. If you get the chance, don't mess around. You need to kill him. And no joke, Peter Parker actually considers it. But Peter Parker's a good guy, and you know he can't do that. He can't take a life. So he's like, you know what? I'm going to try something else first. And if push comes to shove, maybe I will take out Norman Osborn. But let's try something different first. So what he does, he goes and gets uh, Sue Storm, you know, uh, Miss uh, Invisible Woman uh, from the Fantastic Four. And he goes and asks her, I need a favor. And they go into an alley where Venom is, like Matt Gargan. And he's kind of enjoying his power. He's like, hey, I'm back in New York. I'm going to pick up some girls. Uh, this is something that's setting up here because it kind of pays off in the Brian Reed Sinister Spider-Man story that we're going to talk about here in a minute. Uh, but Matt Gargan is kind of, he's on new meds. He's asked, acting a little weird. And now he seems to be off those meds. And he's just like, you know, <laughs> he, I guess he just wants girls all the time. And so he has uh, girls coming in, you know, into the alley and he's like flirting with them. And then he's like, you know, like kissing on them. And then he starts to turn into Venom to eat them. And meanwhile, Bullseye dressed as Hawkeye is kind of on guard. And he's like, you know, over and he's like, you know, flicking things to see if he can hit targets. I think at one point he picks his nose and flicks the booger and like hits like a target or something. It's, I don't know, weird stuff in this book for sure. So what happens is Spider-Man comes into the alley. He saves the girls and Sue Storm, um, you know, invisible girl, she shows up, uses her powers to put a bubble around Spider-Man and Venom so Venom can't call for help to uh, you know to Hawkeye or to Bullseye I guess and Spider-Man beats the living crap out of Venom and so you get a good fight here with Matt Gargan Venom and Spider-Man 
And Spider-Man wins, like like really easily beats the living crap out of him because he comes prepared and he has weapons and tools and things that shut him down. And then with that invisible bubble around them, uh, they're silenced. And so they can't be heard like a block away where, where Bullseye is. So Spider-Man takes him down and then uh, and then gen uses like a machine that the Fantastic Four came up with and generates a suit. So he's wearing the black suit and the face, you know, kind of mutates around to make it look like the Venom face. Uh, and so uh, so then they take uh, Matt Gargan and they capture him and they put him somewhere. And I'm like, all right, now that we have that, Spider-Man is like, I'm going undercover into the Dark Avengers. And that's what he does through most of this book is he's like kind of standing by and seeing what they're doing. And he even jumps in at one point and saves Norman Osborn's life when someone tries to kill him. Uh, and then, you know, Norman notices that's a little out of character. He's like, oh, Mac, I didn't know you cared. And then uh, Bullseye and other characters start picking up that uh, he's acting a little differently and he's, you know, acting a little weird. He's showing the Venom face more when he should be showing the Black Spider-Man face. So they're not idiots, uh, you know, and they know all about deception. They, these are the bad guys after all. So they point out that Spider-Man is actually, uh, it is Spider-Man. It's not Venom, uh, but it's Spider-Man. And, and the person who knows it first is Wolverine's son, Ken. And so he comes in and starts attacking Spider-Man. But then Spider-Man takes him down, beats him up. Uh, and then Norman Osborn walks in and goes, what's happening? He's like, hey, this guy just tried to kill somebody. Like, you know, and I, he's like, he's, he's gone rogue. So I took him down for you, Norman. And Norman's like, really? And then Bullseye comes out and shoots two arrows in Spider-Man's legs and, uh, and, and drops him, you know. Uh, and then they pick him up. They start, you know, uh, interrogating him torturing him and spider-man you know is being asked all these questions like you know what do you know about mac where is mac at you know how did you infiltrate us and norman's like maybe if i just take off your mask then we just reveal who you are to everybody here and we just kill you it doesn't matter you know and they're playing that game but then that's when harry has learned about lily learned that the child is not his that his dad has been still manipulating him, still getting him to do what he wants to do and not giving, you know, Harry any free will. And he says, screw this. So he takes the uh, American sun suit, powers up, and he goes and he fights his dad and he saves Spider-Man's life. So this is a pretty cool fight because it's it's Harry versus Norman. Like normally these battles always end with Spider-Man versus Norman and you always see that thing. But it's so cool to see Harry, Harry Osborn fighting his dad, both of them in like Iron Man suits and they're just going at it. And, uh, and then Harry at the end is like, you know what, dad, you wanted me to put on the suit and go out in the spotlight with you? No. He's like, you're going to go out in the spotlight by yourself. You're going to tell the world that you don't, you know, that your son is a disappointment and I'm going to be okay with that. And he goes, stay away from me. Tell Lily to stay away from me. And I want nothing to do with you. You're a monster. And he takes off the suit and, you know, you know, throws it down, destroys it, and leaves him with Spider-Man. And Spider-Man is even still kind of like, eh, I could still, you know, do something about it. But he's like, I'm not gonna. Norman Osborn's a monster, but, you know, his time will come, basically. And uh, and that's when the, this book, in, in particular, ends where it's, uh, you know, Norman Osborn talking to Lily. And he's like, don't worry, our son's here. And he's, like, holding her close. And she's like, uh, you know, I guess going along with it, I guess she likes you know, Norman Osborn. So really creepy, that whole dynamic with the, the relationships and stuff and the fact that he's you know this dead set on having another son and especially when he has a grandson in this timeline it's like dude you have normie like a hairy son why don't you try to you know turn him into a bad guy um you know or something he goes but this going this level this is where like some of these spider-man stories they kind of lost me that's why i didn't read all of them in succession because i kept switching writers and all of them had really weird ideas and uh, this one where norman osborne it was like before this norman osborne like had you know, i think he had got uh, Gwen Stacy pregnant and they did like a story where she had twins and they became like super powered uh, gray goblin characters or something and it was just like it was it's too much they need they, they I understand he's a bad guy but they need to pull the reins back on stuff like this and luckily they did after this and Norman just went back to just being a standard bad guy uh, but uh, but this this was really creepy <laughs> this book uh, but American Son overall I thought was a good book because it was cool to see Harry Osborn stand up to his dad finally which is something you know it's always good to see classic Spider-Man stuff is always good to see so that ends this chapter but it's still not done we still have plenty more of Dark Avenger stuff to go through and we have to lead up to Siege but first let's talk about the Sinister Spider-Man miniseries this book is probably the most like characterization put into Matt Gargan Venom throughout everything we've talked about today because really what Brian Michael Bendis does a lot of times with symbiotes is he doesn't add a ton to them uh, in my opinion it was kind of neat what he did in Ultimate Spider-Man where it's like oh it's kind of like a, a thing that they were using like a, a bodysuit that will work with your you know you know DNA and everything and your antibodies to fight off against cancer and other things uh, it was a, a neat approach but then once you know Eddie merges with the suit 
Uh, there's nothing really there big time as a character. It just needs to feed. It needs to feed. And that's kind of what Brian Michael Bendis does in most of this anyway. So I, I don't really, even though it's kind of like the Warren Ellis thing. I like the Warren Ellis run, but what they do with Venom in it isn't that great. They don't really tap into Matt Gargan or even really come up with a take on his character. They're just like, oh, he's like, uh, he's scared and the suit's in him and it feels cold and it feels hot. And okay, now he's going to be on meds and he's going to act a weird, little weird and differently. Seeing him in this book, although I don't fully agree with the characterization of it, at least it's a characterization. And that's what makes this book interesting and what makes that little blip in the last book kind of interesting, where Joe Kelly took a page from this and was like, hey, uh, Venom, he likes girls and he's like in an alley and he has girls show up. That's kind of what he does in this book. Brian Reed wrote this and Brian Reed, he's like done stuff on Halo and everything and I'm a big Halo fan and it's just, it was neat to see him come over and do some Spider-Man stuff. He worked with Brian Michael Bendis a lot too and I think Bendis was like, hey, you should give this guy a chance to Marvel. I don't know if that's exactly how it went down but um, either way, I'm glad Brian Reed showed up because some of the stuff he wrote was neat and what I like that he was doing in this, the Sinister Spider-Man miniseries was one, he teamed up with some good artists. He had Chris Piccolo do uh, some, most of the artwork in this, who I love his artwork. Uh, and then all the way going back to Generation X days, like I love his stuff. Uh, and then I think Rob De, uh, DeSalvo uh, did like some you know, pages here and there in issues three and four to kind of fill in for Chris, uh, who I guess was maybe falling behind because of the work schedule or whatever, or the release dates. So uh, either way, it does look good. The book itself looks really great. And the book is called Sinister Spider-Man. It's part of the Dark Reign storyline, everything we're talking about. But this is the most Matt Gargan in it. It is focused purely on him. You get to see what he's thinking at times, uh, what he's, you know, against, what he's for, uh, you know, what he what he wants to do with his time. Like, all of that is things, you know, those are things that are missing from all the other stuff. From uh, Dark Avengers 1, Volumes 1, 2, and 3 from Siege, which we're going to talk about next here in a minute, uh, and then, uh, you know, the last Dark Avengers trade, the Utopia X storyline, the American Sun, um, like, American Sun had a blip of it, but then he gets captured right after, and he's not in the book the rest of the book. So, uh, so here is, like, really where we get to sink our teeth in the Matt Gargan and see what kind of venom he is, and it's, it's interesting. It's it's not one I fully agree with, but at least it's a take. It has a there's characterization, there's motive at times, uh, there's a say in stuff. Uh, and even though you don't really hear the symbiote talk to him that much, which is probably the one major thing missing from this book, it does have some of it in there, but it's not played up the way most Venom books are. Uh, but in this one, what you have is Mac kind of being Spider-Man and kind of loving it. You know, every, he, everyone thinks he's Spider-Man. So he's like, hey, I'm going to like hook up with girls. I'm going to go to, you know, uh, dance clubs, <laughs> you know, and hook up with girls. And sometimes I might eat them. Sometimes I may not. He's just like, he's treated like a real um, psychopath, obviously, on the team. Uh, but he has a little bit more freedom. And he's, you know, out there doing things. And he's affecting stuff. And he's even going after J. Jonah Jameson. J. Jonah Jameson is like, you know, still on his anti-Spider-Man kick. And so he tells him, like, and Matt Gargan's like, look, uh, J. John Jameson created me as the Scorpion. Uh, for those who don't know the background on the Scorpion, Matt Gargan, he was created by J. John Jameson, by, you know, something he set up to do to turn Mac into a formidable foe to fight Spider-Man. Uh, so he doesn't have a lot of love for J. John Jameson, and J. John Jameson doesn't have a lot of love for Spider-Man. So now that Matt Gargan is Spider-Man, they kind of play on that in this miniseries, and I really, really dig that. And so he actually, uh, uh, Spider-Man, or Venom, I guess, or Matt Gargan, he frames... Uh, you know, J. John Jameson, who is trying to do more than just run the newspaper. He's, I think he's trying to run for mayor at this point. He's trying to get into politics and stuff. And so, you know, Matt Gargan's like, you know what? No, I don't want to see you advance. So he like, kills like his assistant or a girl and leaves her in, uh, in J. John Jameson's hotel room or his apartment room or something. And he's trying to frame him. And then meanwhile, while that's going on and he's having a lot of fun doing that, uh, they have these other villains that are uh, like Wolf and all these other like, you know, really D-list characters that are coming together who have all experienced battling against Venom or other characters. They've lost limbs, they've lost arms, and there's a guy named the Redeemer that's putting them all together. And he's like, all right, all of you, it's like a, you know, like an AA meeting. And they're all sitting around telling stories about you know, how Venom or other characters ruin their lives. So they're like, all right, well, let's stick it back to Venom. Let's all unite and let's go after Venom. And while that's happening, Norman Osborn is also like, you know what? You know, Mac needs to be kind of kept on a leash. You know, he's going a little too crazy. I'm going to send Bullseye and Wolverine or, you know, Deken and Hawkeye, I guess. But he's going to say, I'm going to send them, my two of my best assassins, to go shut Mac down. I need, he's gone too far. He's not taking the meds anymore. He's, you know, killing random women all over the city. I can't have this trek back to us. Uh, he's, you know, he's having too much fun. So we need to rein him in or we need to kill him. So uh, Bullseye and Deken are kind of out there going to do that. And so they're on that mission uh, while everything else is going on. And then Norman sets up this thing where uh, that, that Spider-Man has to get 
get like uh, you know an award ceremony or something, and J. Jonah Jameson has to be the one to do it, and then he, J. Jonah Jameson has to hire Spider-Man to be like his bodyguard during these different events and stuff, and it's really neat because it's like you know they're like oh you know. Um, uh, like they call Norman Osborn of the Avengers and like, hey, someone framed, uh, you know, J. Jonah Jameson. What do you want us to do? And he's like, can you send us an Avenger to help keep him protected while we go through some of these campaign stuff? And they're like, yeah, sure. Take Spider-Man. <laughs> so now Matt Gargan is right next to the guy he framed. And there's like that whole relationship throughout the book. So I really dug it. I think Sinister Spider-Man is a very good book. I feel like it's a, it's a little underrated. I don't see a lot of people talk about it, but the people I do see talk about it, they really have an affinity for it. They seem to like it too. Uh, but you may be different, so if so, let me down the, uh, know in the comments below if you've read this and feel differently. But if you haven't, I, I suggest you pick it up because then, you know, Venom gets his revenge. Those other D-list villains attack him. He ends up biting the Redeemer's arms off and he like, you know, is like now makes him... Uh, a fellow amputee with all the other guys and then they're like all right we need to come up with another plan now you know whatever uh but he takes them on and fights them he uh you know sticks it to J. Jonah jameson in a way uh and then also he ends up taking down uh, uh bullseye and deken and proves himself as a hero as spider-man uh, in the public and then goes back to Norman osborne and is like all right fine i'll rein it in all right if you're gonna, you're gonna stop sending killers after me i'll rein it in he's like i had my fun let's get down to business and he's like good because we're gonna attack Asgard soon and he's like and I'm gonna need everyone on deck all hands on deck so Venom's like fine let's do this and that's where we're gonna lead into next which is the conclusion of this whole episode which is the big crossover event that happened uh, but it was really intimate too at the same time normally these crossover events have five or ten issues or like eight to ten issues or whatever this one only had four and it was called Marvel's Siege but before we get into the main Siege crossover book we got to first talk about the third volume of Dark Avengers, which is called Dark Avengers Siege. And it's the four issues or three issues or whatever that tie into this event. Um, and so in this, in these three issues, you kind of get a lot of wrap up. You know, we they kind of put a bow on the Bob storyline with Sentry. And they have Sentry, uh, basically they realize they can't control him anymore. The, the creature in his head is, you know, just getting too powerful, getting too strong, uh, keeps rebuilding Bob in new ways and, you know, and making him more and more stronger and everything. And so normally... Norman Osborn's like, I can't deal with this. I need to try to rein this guy in. And it's not working. So what they do is he gets bullseye and says, hey, look, take his wife and tell her you're bringing her to safety. And then as you're like flying across the Atlantic or whatever, whether in a plane or, you know, whatever mode of transportation you take, kill her and dump her body and then tell, you know, the sentry that you buried her in the desert somewhere. And then he'll go look in deserts for her. And when he doesn't find her, you know, he'll lose his crap. Sure. But then I think that'll be the final thing I need to rein him in and maybe, you know, and reach the void creature in him. Because the thing that's holding that back is Bob, and the thing that uh, you know, and the thing I need if we're going to go fight Asgard is the Void. I don't need Bob anymore. And he goes, so let's let's try this and see if this works. And Bullseye, of course, he's crazy. He's like, yeah, I'll do it. So he goes and he kills Bob's wife and uh, and makes it look like she jumped and tried to commit suicide because earlier in the book she tried that on her own and Bob saved her. And so she's like, look, I don't want to be alive anymore. I don't want to be with you. You're a monster. There's something inside you. Why won't you let me die? And the void is like, because Bob wants you alive. And as long as, you know, as long as he gets what he wants, I can still do what I want to do. And so again, Norman Osborn sees this and is like, I, I can't let this happen. So Norman has Bob's wife killed. And now the sentry is no longer really Bob anymore. He's mostly the void because Norman Osborn used that opportunity to kind of get rid of the Bob personality. And he reached right into the void. And he says, look, void. I understand what you want. You want power. You want this. Help me destroy Asgard and you'll have all the power you want. Uh, you know, just help me do this. Uh, they're on American soil. At this point in the comics, all the Asgardians have been reborn in new human bodies. And now they're like, you know, uh, back on Earth. Uh, so they're, you know, Asgard experienced Ragnarok. So it's gone. And now all the Asgardians on Earth and they're floating above like a chunk of land in like Nevada or, or Arizona or something. And there's like their castle is just kind of floating there and all of them live on it. And Norman Osborn's like, yeah, they're not paying rent here, and we don't want Asgardians here, so let's go take him down. So he's putting his team together, and meanwhile, you know, Ares says goodbye to his son. He's like, look, keep the Secret Warriors out of this. We're going to go deal with this. Norman Osborn wants it, and I want to go cut off some heads of some, uh, you know, uh, of, of enemy Asgardians, but I also want to give my Asgardian brothers a chance to uh, yield and, and surrender willingly so that I don't have to, you know, stain my axe with their blood. So he has some good motivations. Again, there's some heart to Ares, the god of war. And then, of course, there's Moon stone and all these other characters that have signed up on the team novar who uh, in this book uh, in this dark avengers trade decides to go rogue 
and fight back against Bob and the you know the Sentry and the Dark Avengers, and he escapes and he becomes like a new character, a new version of a Marvel character. Uh, so that was kind of neat to kind of see that. And Chris Piccolo did the artwork again in that one shot. It was an annual, I believe. So that was really cool. And then now that Norman Osborn, he doesn't have his Captain Marvel anymore, but he still has Miss Marvel and Wolverine and Venom and everybody. So he's like, all right, let's go in and let's attack Asgard. And so that's where we go right into the Siege book. And uh, and in this book, it's four issues, and it's right to the point. Uh, they do not mess around with this at all. And this is why Siege is one of my favorite Marvel event books, because it's just done. Like, Brian Michael Bendis knew. He was like, I, I know that this story does not need to be dragged out. Uh, you know, we did 16 issues of Dark Avengers with Mike Diodato, who did all the artwork, and he was phenomenal on that. He did a lot of great stuff in these books. I love his artwork so much. But Vendis was like, now we got to bring it home. we got to wrap it up. So Oliver Coipel comes in to do the artwork on these four issues of Siege. And it's awesome. Because we had all the heroes on the run. Captain America and, the, and his Avengers. Luke Cage and his Avengers. And all of them have been on the run. And Bucky became Captain America in the comics. And Spider-Man went underground. And Wolverine has been out there underground too. And working with the X-Men. And then off uh, with the, the underground Avenger team and stuff. So... It's been really great. This is the culmination of all of that. Everything from Secret Invasion, where the heroes went this way and became enemies, and the villains became the heroes, now it's all coming to a head in Siege here. And that's what makes this book so fun, because every battle, you just don't want the Dark Avengers to win. But what they do first, because Norman Osborn obviously is a strategist, and he's trying to make this a PR thing, uh, what he does is he uses Loki, because he gets the Cabal together, and he wants everyone on the same page. And Doctor Doom at this point is like, no, we're not. I'm not on the same page. I don't want anything to do with this. Uh, this is all going to blow up in our faces and backfire on this and uh, Doom's like unless I'm in control I'm not going to do a plan like this and so Norman Osborn's like fine you're out of the you're out of the cabal then and he snaps his fingers and Bob shows up the sentry who is now fully the void and he wipes out uh, Dr. Doom but Dr. Doom turns out to be a Doom bot he would never send his real self to these meetings he sent a Doom bot uh, and then he sent like the Doom bot explodes and all these bugs come out and they almost kill everybody in the room as like a contingency plan uh, but Bob shuts it all down once again as the sentry or as the void and uh, and so Norman Osborn's like, all right, we don't have Doom, but that's fine. Loki, I need you now. And so Loki manipulates it to where he actually like whispers in Volstagg's ear, and Volstagg is like this, you know, big, you know, guy from uh, from the Warriors Three that hangs out with Thor, and he's like walking out. He's on his horse, and he's walking around the town that's near, you know, Asgard. And uh, and they kind of lead him into a battle with villains. They, you know, Norman Osborn and uh, the Avengers. They send like these four like really D-list villains to go in and attack. And Loki's like, I'll help you. We'll power them up a little bit, and we'll send them to like a stadium, like where a football game is playing. And we'll send them there. It'll be very public. And they're kind of kind of repeat what happened at Stanford with Civil War. They're like, we need a big incident, something that'll make us act, that'll get the president on board to have us you know to sign off on everything we need to do so we can go attack Asgard and uh, and so what they do is they plan this whole thing out Volstagg shows up at the the stadium it's full of people those villains attack and then they explode like when they get in a big fight and there's a big explosion and it kills everybody at the stadium and it's like Stanford all over again so of course now the world is like in America especially sees this on the news and they're like no the Asgardians got to go and so Norman Osborn's like see the people want it so let me go in and do it and of course the government at this point is like we don't understand why did this attack happen it seems so random you know that you know and they're like of course it's ran random battles happen all the time with superheroes like no but it's they're so careful over there in asgard they've not you know even ruffled a, a like a, a strand of grass like this seems really weird to us we're not going to send you in and norman osborne's like you know what screw this we're going in anyway i'm not going to wait for the government and at this point you see norman osborne is really cracking just like at the he started to do at the end of the thunderbolts run where he's starting to lose it and the green goblin persona is coming back out and that's what's happening here he's just like you know what i'm going to give in the goblin needs blood he wants me to kill and uh, these Asgardians are ruining everything, and they're here on uh, our soil, and I don't want that anymore. We drove the mutants away. We can drive the Asgardians away, so let's get to it. So he has Bob. He's got his, you know, void creature. He's got Ares of God of War to try to be diplomatic about it, and then they're like, we're going to go in and attack. And so they do. They go in, and man, do they get a fight. It is a really awesome fight between the Dark Avengers and all of the Asgardians that are there to fight them. Uh, Ares has tried really hard to be diplomatic. It's not working, and then Ares decides to turn on Norman Osborn when he hears about his you know his son could get involved the secret warriors are maybe coming in and he's like no you know like we need to end this battle now I, I can't have any more lives lost humans or as guardians and Norman Osborn's like you know what Bob take care of Ares and Sentry walks over to Ares and rips his head right off and kills him and it, right in front of everybody and so at this moment you see Norman Osborn is gone even some of his you know loyal followers like Moonstone and stuff they're like uh 
this is not going to end well. And I think Victoria Hand, who's been working with him at his side, she's like, uh, this is not going to end well. And it's just been, it's one disaster after another, and they're losing. And uh, and on top of everything, now everyone's scared because the Void has been released. Bob is no longer in a physical form. The, the Cthulhu monster is out, up floating above his head, and it's killing everybody. And, uh, and they have lost control. And Norman Osborn doesn't seem to care because his end goal is still to wipe everyone out. And that's when the government says, you know what? We've been at this for so long, Cap, Steve Rogers, uh, you've been working with us in secret since your return. We're going to send you and these Avengers, we're going to give you a second chance at redemption. Go save lives. And Captain America is like, don't worry, I'm on it. And so he gets his Avengers team, the underground Avengers team, Luke Cage's team, Spider-Man, Wolverine, everybody. They rally together, the Secret Warriors, and they're like, we're going in and we're going to save the day. Real quick as a side note though, there is a book, a graphic novel called uh, Siege Battlefields. And in that there is a, a bunch of one shots that show you like the, the runaways and the young Avengers and all these other characters that are kind of caught up in this. Uh, it gives you a moment, uh, a single issue of them fighting against the Dark Avengers and other characters. And uh, and it's pretty neat and like against, you know, evil shield agents or hammer agents as they were. Um, it's, it's really cool to see all this happening. And then you have Loki there and he's, you know, kind of seeing everything play out and manipulate He's making deals with like Mephisto and and uh, you know trying to to secure a potential future for him in the world of mysticism and and everything and still being in the realm of living I guess uh, because he knows everything's going uh, south and he might actually have to intervene uh, which is very unLoki like right he's mostly a bad guy but when he sees everything getting torn apart and he sees Asgard falling there's a part of him he's like hey I, I'm part Asgardian whether I want to love it or not uh, and that is my brother down there who is dying and I might need to step up and so uh, so you have these little cool stories in that and one of them is a story with Venom since we're the Venom vlog we'll talk about that one most which is Spider-Man and Miss Marvel uh, the real Miss Marvel not the the Moonstone Miss Marvel but the real Miss Marvel teaming up to fight against Venom Matt Gargan and this is a key issue because obviously this is how we see Matt Gargan fall because in the main book in Siege we don't see what happens to him he gets beaten like off panel or something and you don't really know what happened but this one shot takes care of it so all these one shots are collected in one book but the main one we're going to talk about is the Spider-Man Battlefields book and in this one, you have Spider-Man and Miss Marvel kicking the crap out of Venom. I think Spider-Man even rips Venom's tongue out at one point, and they beat him up. He throws him up in the air, and Miss Marvel knocks him out of the park like a baseball style. Uh, and seeing them do that is really neat. And again, getting more of a another Matt Gargan, Peter Parker fight after American Sun was really cool to see. And it, it stretches out over a new, uh, number of pages uh, and takes up a lot of this book, which I really like. Because again, we don't get a ton of Mac as a personality. But in this fight, you see a little bit of that with him against Peter Parker and some of that symbiote personality too. So uh, it was cool to see that and you know take a little pause from the main book to kind of get this one shot in there because it's very essential because what happens is they beat Venom, he lands somewhere and the government picks him up and they're able to separate Matt Gargan from the symbiote. And so that is where the suit is, is now it's under government protection. And that's how it ends up essentially uh, in the Rebirth 2.0 program with Flash Thompson. But we'll talk about that in season three. Uh, but for here, that's how that book ends and we go right back to the finale of Siege where Norman Osborn is defeated, uh, Bob is defeated, but at the cost, another great cost, which is Loki coming down to intervene, trying to stop the Void, and the Void kills Loki right in front of Thor and all the other Asgardians. And at this point, they're like, what the F, man? Like, we, how many big characters like Ares and Loki are we going to lose? We lost some Asgardians. We lost shield agents, hammer agents. We've lost lives. We need to end this. And so luckily they're able to get through, uh, stop Bob, destroy him once and for all, and uh, leaving Norman Osborn with nothing. And when they go in and they take his Iron Patriot helmet off, his face underneath has goblin paint or mutation on it uh, because he has fully lost it. He is turning mostly into the goblin. And, uh, and his that personality side of him has come out and it cost him all of this, all this damage, everything. And it's now, this is all captured on the news. He's losing it. He's naked and he's sitting there screaming, I'm the goblin, I'm the goblin. Like we were going to do this. We were going to save the world. And it just makes him look really, really crazy. And it's certainly, I'm sure it makes everyone in the world who was happy with him being a dark Avenger, making them feel really, really awful forever rooting for the guy. Um, but it was cool. I mean, I like this time in the comics because it was neat to see what would villains do if they ruled the world. And I know Mark Millar explores that a lot in his stories, but it was nice, nice to see kind like in books like Wanted and stuff, but it was nice to see it in this and see it happen in the Marvel Universe uh, for over a year and a half, which was really, really cool. 
Um, so I dug this overall. Siege was really great. The ending was really great. And there's even an epilogue issue in Dark Avengers Volume 3. There's like the final issue, issue 16 or whatever, of the book. It's collected in that. And you'll actually see the aftermath of Norman Osborn uh, being arrested. And you'll see how the Marvel Universe goes back to the status quo. You see the Avengers get reinstated. The superhero initiative where everyone has to sign up and give out their secret identities, that's destroyed. They rip that paperwork up. The government no longer wants that. And they are fully putting their trust back in heroes again as long as they earn the trust and so obviously a lot of lives were saved from this uh, but you know there's still a lot to prove so Captain America is once again in charge of, uh, of the Avengers so Steve Rogers is put in, in charge once again along with Bucky and Luke Cage and everyone else and they decide to put together a new generation of Avengers and that's where the Marvel Universe heads after this uh, but as far as us Venom fans what we know is that the suit was taken by the government and it will pop up again and we'll talk about it in season three and we will talk about Flash Thompson but first we're going to back track and talk about those Eddie Brock storylines that we missed, like Hunger and Sign of the Boss and some of those storylines, Tooth and Claw. We're going to get into all those in Season 3 at the beginning of it, but after we about halfway through Season 3, we'll probably start talking about the Flash Thompson stuff. So this is not the end of Venom, obviously. This is just the beginning of the next chapter where Flash Thompson ends up working for the government as a new character called Agent Venom. All right, so that is the end of this episode. Man, we went over a lot. Like I said, this was originally going to be like five or six videos, so I appreciate all of you for sticking with me on this. I know this is a lot. I know I talk fast sometimes. I hope I didn't, you know, go over anything, you know, too loosely. If you want to know more details, we can certainly talk more about it down in the comments down below. And I think a lot of these are out of print, so like I said, I'll put links to all the Comixology books or versions of these books down below. And I highly recommend you go pick them up, whether you wait for a sale or not. That's totally up to you. But a lot of these books are really really good. I found myself really enjoying the Marvel Universe during the time of the bad guys in charge. I don't know what that says about me, but I felt like we got a lot of new storylines there. I mean, we've seen bad guys win before and stuff, but seeing it like this, where for like a year and a half, they, the, the dark rain happened at Marvel, and all the bad guys were the ones making the decisions, and the heroes were the ones who had to be like super reactionary and had to be underground and couldn't show their faces or else they could get arrested, and they had to deal with cops. Like That's nothing new really for Spider-Man, but for the rest of the Marvel Universe, it was kind of new. And so it was neat. I really enjoyed this time. And so I'm glad I got to cover it all in one video because you see how massive this is. And we didn't even talk about the full Dark Reign or full everything. We just focused on books that Venom was in pretty much. Uh, but there was so much more that happened during this time. So if you've read those books, these ones or other ones of Dark Reign, let me know what you feel about them down below. And if this was your first exposure to them, and if you have any questions, let me know those down below too, and I'll do my best to answer them. Thanks so much for watching my show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And I'll see you in the future. Peace.